What's up? Are we live yet? <laughs> yeah, I think we are live now. <laughs> no way. Um, <laughs> let's give it a second. The first viewers are joining again, so I think we are back and online. Whew, my gosh. <laughs> Okay, cool. Martin, Edwid, I'm super happy to see you. Um, if you want, you uh, maybe you want to give a quick intro, um, who you are, what you're doing, what App Agent does? Yep, definitely. Well, Andre, first of all, thanks for having us. And thanks for managing to solve all the technical difficulties. Very happy to be here. <laughs> uh, my name is Martin. This is Wheat. Uh, right. We're from App Agent, which you can see behind us. Uh, AppAgent is a marketing agency, 360 degrees, scope of work. So we do basically everything from creatives to what we're going to discuss today, and that is analytics and marketing analytics. Um, me, myself, I'm something like a marketing analyst slash marketing manager, so doing all kinds of stuff uh, around user acquisition, uh, data analytics, and stuff. And Vitek here, I let him introduce himself. He actually made himself a new haircut for this stream, so <laughs> I'm really happy that he can be seen. Finally, so, so much appreciate it. Uh, I'm data analyst slash data engineer slash data scientist, so whatever you want, uh, I work with data. <laughs> whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> I can everything. <laughs> Uh, cool. To, uh, really cool to have you here. Um, I'm actually expecting a, a really um, a deep insight into all the things that I'm working with every day and most of us who are viewing the stream now as well. Um, I think most of us are just scratching the surface of all the data things that we are working with uh, when we are looking at our dashboards, Tableau and Excel files whatsoever and you are really working hands on on the tools that uh, build the backbone of the things that we are actually using very often, right? Um, so what are we learning today from you? Do you have like a quick agenda maybe? Um, or do we just want yeah, to that, jump yeah. into the presentation right away? Uh, that, was, that was actually building some nice expectations, Andre. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're working with these tools basically every day. Uh, the agenda for today is actually us telling you a story about how we created our own marketing analytics. And we're going to mention how the process went, uh, where we started, what were the first tools that we created, and we're going to show you exactly these, uh, who we talked to to kind of get our insights, how we proceeded to plan all the stuff. And the main part of today's talk will be around uh, the tool set and uh, why we picked the tools we did, how we connected them together, and we're going to try to show you as much as we can visually without talking too much about it. Uh, so yeah, after a brief introduction, let's see how it goes. And uh, hopefully you're going to enjoy a nice, partly hands-on session today. That is cool. Um, maybe for the audience here, if you have any question, always feel free to put something in the comments. We try to answer them. Um, when I see the questions popping up, uh, I will quickly read them and um, ask you where it fits um, while you are talking, guys. Um, maybe a quick announcement also, in, let's say in the middle of the stream or somewhere, you're going to announce a free giveaway, is that right? Yes, that is very right. So we hope for a good retention <laughs> of our audience. Yeah, there's going to be a free giveaway. So hi, audience, you're going to have a chance to win two free tickets for APS next week. So bear with us, stay with us, and once it's time, we're going to tell you what to do. Cool. For those who don't know, APS App Promotion Summit uh, is happening in Berlin, 6th of the, uh, December. Um, I'm on the panel as well um, in the workshop room, and I guess uh, a good, good portion of the audience uh, will see us there uh, in real life as well. All right, Lo, let's go. Awesome. So we're going to share a presentation and jump right into it. So just, just to manage expectations, we are not only looking at the presentation today. There will be a deep insight into tools and uh, how the tools are being used um, also. So uh, stay with us. Yep. So I think that we can jump over the intros. Uh, actually, Andrea basically bent us to do a long intro. So let's just jump right into <laughs> actual content. Uh, but first of all, before we jump to uh, any parts of the story, uh, I'd like to sync with you guys on what are the marketing analytics levels that people are basically using out there today? And the way we look at it and what we see in our clients is that there are four main analytic levels. The first one, when it comes to marketing reporting, is basically no reporting or manual. 
uh, where people are looking on Facebook or just manually downloading stuff and using Excel. The second level is already automated reporting where uh, some people quit the team because they hate to download things manually. And so the team eventually came up with API, Autopool, and ETLs to get the insights they need. The third level is actually using this data, but not just visualizing it, but also working with it actively and creating some LTV ROI predictions. And the final level uh, that I see right now around me, and which I think was covered on the last stream with Lior Barak, is creating automation. Uh, that's definitely not a point that we're at. We're probably somewhere at round level three. And the first question for you guys is what level are you on? Uh, I'm going to put that slide back for a couple of seconds. And if you could type into the chat, where do you find yourself, your company, or your companies at? It would be great so we can kind of get back to it later on and see uh, what is the audience level in this regard. And a couple of words around uh, what's actually happening in the real world, because we have quite a lot of clients, even big ones or startup ones or basically all types of sizes and shapes. And what we are seeing is that a huge amount of clients just have no reporting or they are actually maximally at the level of automated reporting. They are either using paid tools or they did something themselves, but it's not really advanced. Usually it's faulty and we grew very frustrated because of that. So in the end, uh, we decided to solve this problem uh, where we definitely for the user acquisition and for soft launch evaluations and stuff like that need a pretty good way to evaluate quickly and efficiently. So we decided to create our own tool and we decided to build it, not buy it. And the main reason was each of our clients is very different and there is no one size fits all on the market. We just need to work with the data, be able to universally connect any tools that the person might have. And that was one of the biggest requirements that we had. We also wanted to be cost effective. Quite a lot of startups don't want to pay a lot of money for such a tool. And as I mentioned, we wanted to have a data source independent solution. So how did we actually approach the problem of building it? And truth be told, Right at the start, we knew basically nothing and we were just starting out. So it was a lot of reading, a lot of listening to podcasts like this one, a lot of help from outsiders. And eventually we reached a point where we created our first own prototype. And Vitek, can you please show how that worked and what it was? It was created in Google Sheets and uh, this is how it looked like. It was for one of our clients, and we actually wanted to learn how did the LTV curve shape looked like. And we pulled the data over the API from Facebook, Google, and AppsFire. And then via Google Apps Scripts, we created uh, this beautiful tool. And Vitek, can you please show the second part of it, which is the uh, Google Scripts part? This one? Yeah, this one. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to show you that we started like really, uh, really weakly, to be honest. <laughs> and the way we did it, uh, we obviously knew that we needed AppSolar data and App Network data. Uh, so Vitek wrote his own connector for AppSolar in this tool, which is Google Sheet Scripts. And he actually downloaded over Google some kind of a script for downloading Facebook data, which he then adjusted sneakily so it did only the job that we needed it to do and eventually it worked which was awesome <laughs> so you can see that it's it's a lot of pages so uh there was a lot of commenting but eventually it worked so we we had ourselves our first version of the tool if you can show it show it back where you had a chance to actually select the campaign in a drop down menu which was awesome pick one and then see all the data change, see the LTVs, and see the revenues, install numbers, and stuff like that. So it was basically where we started. And it was a nice prototype of something that would be much useful if it was done in a more robust fashion, but uh, that's where we started. There are clear limitations, and one of them is that in Google Sheets, you can only have, I think, two millions of cells. And once you exceed that number, uh, it just stops working. 
And also the Google Scripts is not a very reliable platform for ETLing and script running, which we learned eventually. Uh, so that's why we kind of abandoned this, although financially very efficient, but uh, yeah, pretty, pretty faulty and insufficient uh, way of doing this. Andre, any questions around this? Well, if you can go back to the um, CSV, no, to the to the Google Sheets thing that you ha had. So, what can we actually see here? What did you pull? You pulled uh, Facebook data and uh -huh. the, and Apps Flyer data, and you merged that and tried to understand for each campaign or ad set um, how good the performance was, but also like which LTV you will like, expect or what it uh, what it actually delivered. Is that right? Yeah, basically, yes. Uh, I think that we had it on the asset level and we downloaded the install and purchase data from AppsFlyer. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of ETL'd that in a very simple fashion and we created like a lifetime uh, lifetime table, that's what we call it, uh, where you can see uh, how the average LTV per user develops over his lifetime. So that's what the curve that you can see right here, if you can see my cursor. You can see how it rises and you can see the slope. And that was revolutionary for us because before that we were just looking at the numbers. So for example, we knew what the day 90 LTV was, but we had really no idea how the slope was going on. So if the users were spending a lot during the first days, which is for example, in this case, pretty nicely visible. And then the purchases just stopped coming in. So just by looking at the curve, you can actually understand quite a lot around what the monetization is and how it goes. So this is the main curve, which we can see right here. Mm -hmm. this curve in the gray uh, is the cumulative number of installs for which you have a data for that certain day. So uh, there's basically a line that tells you how many installs did you have for that particular campaign? So for example, here you can see, okay, it's only 1,000 or around 1,000 data points. So that's not a lot, so obviously you won't make any conclusions based on this. Uh, but that's why the curve is here, to kind of uh, not let you do any preemptive conclusions. And if you look at these uh, straight lines, mm -hmm. I think that's the CPI. So you can actually compare what the final LTE was against the CPI, and you can understand at which point did you cross the CPI line and actually broke even. Obviously, in this case, it's linear, which in the real life is not. So we just use an average, like a linear CPI line here. And uh, yeah, I mean, as a first version, it actually gave us much, much more insights than the tools that we were using before, which for us were just some like very simple Excel calculations and apps flyer and uh, just looking on Facebook campaign data right in the Facebook interface. That's super interesting. And actually, uh, uh, let's say a very advanced Excel level, I would say. <laughs> yeah, really? um, <laughs> we're kind of ashamed of it, but at the time it was, you know, we were on the top of the Excel world. <laughs> Definitely you were. I mean, I've, I've had uh, HR hiring interviews where I was just uh -huh. asking for creating a pivot table and many people just gave up uh, doing that. <laughs> um, so I can definitely prove that or confirm that this is advanced Excel levels here. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so if Peter, you know, fires us, then we're definitely going to <laughs> um, We got a question from, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Feed Feeder Barons. Um, is the Facebook data straight from the API or how did you pull that? That's from the API, yeah. right? Uh, it's straight, straight from uh, Facebook API. You, you need to uh, make uh, something like application inside uh, Facebook and connect it with your ad account. Etc. It's a, a little bit longer process, but uh, it's not so hard. Uh, you can find uh, tutorials on the internet, and then you are uh, querying d d this application and downloading data right into the uh, Google Sheet. And who was the user of this file in the end? So who was working on that, or co who was a consumer? Um, in the end, I think that there was a group effort, both in terms of creation and also consumption, because at that point for the client that this was uh, this was basically create created for uh, one of our colleagues uh, ran UA campaigns for them. So this was basically to understand how these campaigns were profitable or not. Mm -hmm. But mostly, and the primary reason why it actually got created 
was that we wanted to show if the campaigns are actually profitable in the long term and how does it look like after 90 or 180 days and they had like no idea how it worked so they were just you know looking at uh from my point of view insufficient metrics and this was something like okay we're going to show you how it actually works and we're going to show you that in some countries the monetization looks completely different and if the curve is linear then it means that the users are still playing they're still paying and you know there's some hope in the long-term monetization so that was the main goal mm -hmm. okay um, but this sheet doesn't compare um i mean you have to click through every ad set one by one, right? You do not compare them in, in one view, for example, in such a sheet. Uh, no, obviously, you know, this way of doing stuff has its limitations. Mm -hmm. For us, it was more like a proof of concept and uh, it brought information like, okay, are we looking at good metrics? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. What else are we going to need? And where are the limits of the current setup? And it was really limiting in some way, but it also made us think a lot about, okay, this is where we want to go. This is what we need. And uh, it was basically the, the first cornerstone of our later efforts. So this, the same thing applies then probably to uh, comparing country level data, for example, right? Yes, of course. And I think that in this case, like we were unable to compare if we just wanted to like synthesize, synthesize, um, how to call that, like group, uh, group the data based on countries, mm -hmm. it was not possible. Uh, in this case, like the lowest common denominator was the ad set. And uh, combining that in different ways uh, would probably be just too much for for such an Excel tool. Yeah, I understand that. Um, okay, so you can you go maybe one step back to the uh, connector where you pull the data? Uh, I think many of us have no clue how this works. Uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit about that? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of a script over Google and then have VTech make it work. Uh, exactly. It, it, it's uh, something I didn't wrote myself. Uh, uh, I find a script on the internet and uh, just a little bit uh, tweak it for... for uh, so you just our... manipulated the login data or something, right? But um... yeah, I did it. Uh, uh, here you can see a uh, client ID, client secret. Uh, don't try, try it at home because uh, I, <laughs> I hidden uh, important parts. Uh, but that's something you need to put uh, into and uh, then run it. <laughs> and this uh, you, you have to have some basics of uh, programming to uh, oh. to know what's going on in script. But uh, you don't need to have to wrote, wrote it, uh, write it everything by yourself. No, of course not. But this script, I need to use that in, in, in a specific tool or something, right? I cannot use my uh, WordPad. <laughs> no, no, you can't. Uh, you have to... Uh, so what, what tool would I... On, would on I some uh, server on, uh, in, in some tool which is uh, capable to run such a script. Mm -hmm. can, can you name a tool? What, that, what, what would that be? Excuse me? What would that tool be? What's the name of such tool? Uh, for example, you can use uh, Google Apps Script. Uh, it's capable to do, uh, run these scripts, and you can set, uh, set a, uh, schedule it to, to run it uh, every day at uh, 7 a.m. to have a fresh data before you uh, and enter the uh, door of office. Mm -hmm. Or uh, you can run it in, uh, for example, a virtual machine instance on Google Cloud Platform, uh, which we will uh, uh, go back uh, later in our presentation. Yeah, I understand. And actually, this Google Apps Script is a very powerful feature of the whole Google Sheet uh, family of tools. So we were surprised of uh, like how capable it is, and definitely recommend to anybody who's interested in uh, doing some uh, some prototypes of his own tools to look into it because it's it's free and uh, it's very versatile. Nice. Uh, uh, it's uh, actually a JavaScript behind. You are writing JavaScript code. Mm -hmm. I it personally haven't it, heard about that tool, for example, Google App Script, right? Um, uh, I can show, show how to get there. When, when you have, uh, when you open your Google Sheet, then uh, click Tools and Script Editor. Ah, that's it. Yeah, and that's it. You are here. Nice. Okay. And um, when the other tools from Google, it's really powerful yeah, and has, exactly. has a lot of 
uh, it, a lot of possibilities. Yeah, there, there's possibility to download these data to Google Sheet or to BigQuery, which is a database from Google, or you can uh, uh, save it to Google Cloud Storage, which is something like uh, uh, Google Drive, but uh, more capable. It, it's very powerful. Google has uh, very powerful tools to work with. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, just uh, t <laughs> thanks, Thomas. Uh, you're right. Uh, we should mention that we do not want to copy or the audience should not copy what we did show right now, but maybe what uh, you developed after uh, this step here. Right. So this was just the beginning of, of your journey journey uh, to develop a powerful analytics tool. So maybe um, proceed with your presentation. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's more of like showing the journey and uh, the steps along the way that we think are interesting for the audience, uh, because this is definitely something that basically anybody can do with uh, tiny bits of scripting and coding and already have something better than are his manually, uh, manually used Excel sheets. So anyway, this was our first step. And as I mentioned, we reached different types of limits. And besides the technical limit of only maximum 2 million cells, uh, there's a lot of limitations when you're working with it. Uh, you can't really analyze anything. You can't group the data uh, in a fancy way. You can visualize it in a fancy way. And even like showing it to clients was not something that you want to do every day. So it was a nice prototype, but that was about it. We definitely knew and felt that we needed to step up our game and actually do something that would work in a robust fashion. So we started to gather more knowledge. And uh, this is where a lot of studying and a lot of consultations took place. And uh, I'd like to mention Lior Barak and Jessica Bisego, I think it's pronounced that way. Bichego. <laughs> okay. So uh, we had workshop workshops from uh, these two guys. And they were like definitely very, very helpful and showed us what's actually possible in the whole realm of marketing analytics. And that's something that we'd probably spent ages just to try to figure out ourselves. So it was a great, great jump start. And I definitely recommend anybody who wants to jump into, uh, into the process of trying to create something himself uh, to talk to people around, especially Lior and Jessica, because they can really give you great insights. And based on these, we locked ourselves in a room and thought about, okay, now we know what's actually like possible, but what we can actually do with the resources we have. And also, what kind of makes sense for us to actually build. And before I get to what we've built, I'd like to talk a little bit about resources and what we actually need to build a tool that we did. And we kind of expected that you're going to need a lot of stuff and a lot of people and a lot of knowledge, which is kind of true. But uh, to be honest, it was not that bad. And we tried to be as efficient as possible. And Vitek here was a perfect man for the job because he did not know anything on a very deep expert level, no pun intended. <laughs> but he was like very scrappy in the best sense of the word and was able to download different types of scripts uh, search Stack Overflow very well, in fact, perfectly. He knew the basic principles, copy pasted different types of code. And in the end, <laughs> it didn't work. But, <laughs> but, but in the very end, we actually made it work. So it took us you know, longer. Uh, definitely it would take with somebody who had the experience. But uh, because VTEC was like a 50 trick pony, basically, uh, we were able to achieve what we wanted with basically just him doing all the stuff and learning along the way. And me as like a marketing person, like inputting, okay, we need to look at these metrics and this should be done in this way and stuff like that. So uh, in the end, it took us around three months of work and uh, it was not full time. It was around 30, 40% of our time where we were working for other clients, troubleshooting uh, what we had and uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And to be honest, we learned just so much when trying to develop uh, the tool ourselves that we can now use the knowledge for a huge amount of other areas of the marketing itself. So in the end, you don't really need an army of people that have different expert roles. If you only uh, want to, let's say, go a part of the way, 
And that's quite different than what Lior mentioned on his last talk, that you definitely need like six people or eight people from different roles. That's definitely necessary once you want to have the bidding machine, you really want to have a robust tool that a big company is going to use. But it's not necessary when you just want to start it out and you want to help yourself have all the data on one place and make smart decisions daily with everything automated in, on the reporting side. Hmm. Maybe um, to pick up some people who haven't seen the last uh, video with Lior. So there was a he was showing a matrix um, of what type of people you might need uh, to build a proper analytics stack and uh, which skill set they should bring with them, right? Um, to, for Leo's defense here, uh, he's looking at these kind of things from a big corporation view, right? Um, so there are very often much bigger back-end structures involved and uh, a lot of teams that you have to onboard to get access to certain things uh, on the back-end side and stuff. So it's very often actually necessary to have such a big team in such big corporations that have not a lean setup as, as you might have in, in a startup or something. I completely agree. And it's not to say that Lior wasn't right. I think he definitely was right. And in his, uh, let's say, in the sizes of companies that he's working for or around, it makes complete sense. What we were kind of thinking about that is that it might be scary for some people in smaller companies that, you know, can be five or six people all in all. And then hearing about, okay, if you want to create something, then you need six expert roles. No, so that's true. You're right. Yeah. It's huge. But if you're small, you know, don't be scared. You can start by yourself and do actually something awesome, even with a much smaller amount of people and a much smaller expertise. Yeah. And it's not going to be a bidding machine, obviously. And it's not going to be as far as advanced as, for example, Lior's makings, but uh, still, it's going to work and can be very, very useful. Mm -hmm. All right. So now already quickly to how we actually build a tool. Uh, first of all, uh, on this photo on the left, you can see we thought of a lot of stuff that might be useful in our analytics tool. And human needs and wants are unlimited. And wants and needs of our UA managers are even more unlimited than the word unlimited. So there was a lot of stuff that we thought of. Uh, we divided them into modules, and then we prioritize them based on which of them will make the greatest impact and uh, what were the dependencies. Like, for example, we always wanted to have auto recommendations before we wanted to have automatic bidding. And as you can see, the pyramid is pretty, pretty tall and pretty wide, so there was a lot of things. And right now we're basically somewhere on the first on, on the first step of it around ROI and LTV predictions, which is still in an experimental mode. And uh, to be honest, the automated data pools and reporting and dashboards took us a long, long way. And especially in our business where every company is different, we kind of learned that going up in the pyramid would be like very challenging because you always need uh, to kind of mix and match what you have to different business models and to different apps. And eventually it would probably not make sense for us to really go deep on each of these projects. So we were more like aimed at people that had no marketing analytics themselves and wanted predictions uh, on a certain level. And the rest we want to take care of in the future. But uh, so far we did not really like necessarily needed it. Uh, in our work. So uh, I wonder if anybody is still on the stream because right now we got a free giveaway. We still have uh, 22 viewers. So, but it looks like we have a 100% retention here. So I, th <laughs> I think we are good. Okay, great. So anyway, uh, what percentage does it make if you actually comment on the screen? On the stream, you can win. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, guys, uh, in case you give us feedback and let us know in the comments whether you like or don't like our stream and what we are talking about, uh, you can win two tickets. And as Peter mentioned, it's not for the App Promotion Summit. It's for App Growth Awards. App Growth Awards. So make sure 
to let us know how you like the stream and you can win and hopefully see you there because we are both going to be in Berlin. And now, actually, Andre, we already are running 35 minutes and this is the most important part. So it's going to, as we predicted, it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn out. <laughs> But let's go on. Uh, so this part is around building uh, the whole tool and selecting the sub-tools uh, that we use to connect everything together. And this is the basic outline of which tools we used. So uh, these were the data sources where we had product analytics with session data, in-app data usage and stuff. Uh, then there was obviously an attribution tool uh, where we are taking uh, installations and purchase events in their raw form and the ad networks with costs, impressions, and clicks. And from the attribution tool and networks, we're actually using, uh, or the plan was to use API connectors, which in some form we've shown you in uh, the Google spreadsheet, and then transfer all these data into a database, transform and enrich the data into final tables that can be visualized and visualize it. So this was like a set of tools that uh, we planned to use. And in the end, the specific tools that we used, uh, but it heavily depends on the client, is set up, what does he need? Uh, then what we frequently used was Firebase for in-app data, AppSwire for attribution, can be adjusted or whatever else. And then for our networks and costs, and uh, let's say the API connectors, we used Matillion and Python scripts. Then we downloaded everything into Google BigQuery, and then once again used Matillion for the ETL process. And after that, the road is straight ahead to visualization. Maybe for people like me, what is an ETL process? ETL is a shortcut for extract, transform, and load. It means that you extract data from some data source, transform it. So it means that you calculate something you need or connect or the data and load is that you save it again to uh, BigQuery or uh, any other uh, database. So it's uh, some sort of data cleaning and pre-aggregation, is that right? Yeah, I think pre-aggregation is, is a nice word for that. Yeah. Like combining data from different sources based on some, uh, some common denominator, let's say, and you're simplifying it so you don't have billions of, uh, of raw events, but you have these aggregated tables which then you can visualize simply <clears throat> in the visualization tool. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah, makes sense. OK, and now we'll jump to uh, another part of the live presentation. We have a question whether Tableau is not too expensive. I feel that it is too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> what should I say? It's expensive, and uh, we are using it now. Uh, we were thinking about using another tool, and that's probably something we're going to look into the next year. But uh, for us, it was important just to try it. It was an industry standard and still is. It's got awesome analytics capabilities. So as a first step of kind of uh, having something robust and uh, and greatly done, Tableau was a tool of choice. But obviously, the price is, uh, well, is not I can maybe also say something about that. So, uh, because we just recently changed um, the licensing um, on on my side, so Tableau too expensive? I would say no. Um, it depends a little bit on how your internal setup is. So, and which type of license you actually need. So, there's one. For example, uh, you are in a beginner level of using Tableau or integrating Tableau in your company. Then you probably just need the desktop license. And then you only need one person usually that is actually building the dashboard. So you're actually uh, paying only one personal license. And this comes to like, let, let, um, maybe I'm lying, let it, let it be $800 a year. So it's actually kind of cheap um, with quite, mess, quite uh, a lot of output that you can create from just one license. But if you're having a bigger team and massive amounts of data, you probably need to switch to Tableau Online. Um, where the dashboards are much better to organize and uh, you have a better rights management who can access which dashboards and so on. Um, and for the, let's say, 
people who are just viewing the dashboards, it's also much faster to look at it because the data is being processed on a server and not on, per on every one single computer. Um, but this online license is kind of expensive because every viewer actually needs to pay for it. And this is qu very quickly like 500 bucks per license per year. So then it gets expensive, definitely. Yeah, I think that it definitely depends on the case. And for us, when we are working with clients and they want the data to, you know, they want to access it, uh, different types of stakeholders want to access it. So uh, you never know how many licenses will they actually want. And when I compare the cost for Tableau to other costs for tools in the analytics stack, then I think Tableau is like by far the most expensive one. So it's relative. I mean, uh, you're not going to get bankrupt by using Tableau, but uh, definitely, I mean, the costs for some companies can be can be quite painful, I think. But really depends, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, I was talking about us having different data sources. In this case, it would be attribution tool, apps flyer, and, and networks. And right now, I'd like to show you how we're using the API connectors right now with the help of Metillion and uh, how we're downloading the data and how the data actually looks before we connect it. Okay, and oh, for that's that, really interesting. <laughs> the word to me. Okay, uh, downloading data from AppSlayer is very easy because uh, their API uh, means that you just send URL address with uh, your account owner API key, which is uh, you can find here, we are not owners uh, owners of the, uh, this uh, account, so we can't see it. But uh, if you want to download, uh, for example, install reports, there is a whole address. You can find this in API access in the left uh, toolbox. You can you put your API key here. Uh, you can put uh, data uh, from which uh, day to which day you want to download the data. Just uh, give it into uh, the console and uh, it will start downloading CSV file into your computer. But you, you want to do it automat automatically every day and you want to use some tool. We use, uh, as was mentioned, Metalion, which is a great uh, ETL tool, which is capable to download the data and transform them. Uh, trans transform them. And uh, we choose it because uh, Jessica recommend us uh, there is a nice pricing. Uh, uh, you pay just for uh, up when it runs on our uh, our uh, our basis, and it runs uh, on a Google Cloud platform on as a virtual machine. You can see it. I can show you like a Google Cloud platform virtual machine instance, and here it's running. You can imagine it's uh, it's a virtual computer when something's run. Uh, yeah, and just, just a side note, uh, as you saw the scripts in Google Apps scripts, it's actually ju just a bunch of code. And Metillion's strength, uh, the way I see it, is that you can have it all visual. Maybe they can show us like more flows. How does it look like? Uh, for example, this is how we download the data. <laughs> <laughs> I will show you how to do, do it uh, in a <laughs> better way. Like, um, let's uh, get the hands dirty. We want to download data from AppsFlyer. So here on the left side is components where you can uh, just take cloud storage path object. It means that it, it will download data from somewhere. You connect it from start, click on box, choose uh, input data tape. We are using uh, URL address, so it's HTTPS. <laughs> OK. Here is input uh, data URL. It means you take this one. We want to download install reports. Yes, uh, pay it uh, with your uh, API key. Insert OK, and uh, you want to store it somewhere. So uh, you store it into a Google Cloud bucket. It's uh, something like Google Drive. Just ch choose uh, choose a, a directory, input some name, and. Uh, uh, then it will download. And then you want to upload it into your BigQuery to, to be uh, capable to work with this. And just take another box, uh, which is for uploading data to BigQuery. 
connected with the green dot, it means that when uh, it's successfully downloaded the data, then it can continues to another box. And here you uh, set up uh, into which table you want to uh, upload. So you can choose Epsilon installs iOS data columns. And here you again uh, select uh, what you downloaded in the Google storage. Yeah, that's, pretty, yeah. that's quite straightforward, huh? Yeah, it is. Uh, and that's all. Maybe one question in between uh, from Mikhail. Um, why did you choose Firebase and BigQuery in a combination? What did you, why did you decide for that? It was naturally our decision in the first place. Uh, it was actually one of our first clients that already had Firebase. So it's more of a historical reason. And because of that, we like automatically used BigQuery and we learned how to work with it. And we obviously know that we can do similar stuff on Amazon and uh, probably Azure or other, uh, other online depositories. But we actually had no reason why to switch. And we're not paying too much and we don't have performance problems because of the way we're handling the data and of the amount of data that we're working with. So we actually have no reason why to switch. And it was all like historically, historically given. Okay, fair enough. I, I mean, I also noticed that uh, any any client I work with um, usually already has Firebase uh, implemented for several reasons. Usually it's uh, just because free analytics in some way analytics and uh, um, very often free push notifications uh, functionality. Um, uh -huh. so, so many apps have it just right away and then obviously the integration with uh, BigQuery is quite easy, right? That's actually quite common and especially for new apps that we encounter, people often want to use Firebase and uh, Right now, what we kind of recommend them is using it together with Google Tech Manager and Google Analytics, because Firebase's analytics capabilities are naturally on par <laughs> with any other package. It's like really weak, but uh, if you don't have a lot of data and you can use Google Analytics and kind of leverage it, especially in the first stages, it's a very powerful tool. You can get it for free, and a lot of people are also familiar with it. So uh, the combination of actually having Google Analytics and still have all the raw data in BigQuery uh, seems to be a pretty good one. I, I want to mention that when we are talking about visualization tool, also Google has a data studio, which is still getting better and better. And you can access uh, Firebase data right in from the data studio. Mm -hmm. You can also use it uh, instead of uh, Tableau if you want to go very low cost in the first mm -hmm. stage. Okay, go ahead with the. Okay, you uploaded this um, to cloud storage now, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, in, the in the first box, you download it to uh, Google Cloud Storage, and uh, in the second box, you upload it to BigQuery, which is a database oh. for it. And uh, in, in this case, I want to mention that another important thing uh, to, to, to uh, keep in mind is uh, that uh, uh, data are unstable, uh, servers are unstable, so, and uh, it's quite common that uh, you don't, servers are not responding, so you, you can get the data or it will receive an empty file, etc. So it's important to handle these type of errors. And it, it's another reason why we use Metalion because it's much easier to handle uh, th these things. Uh, b because otherwise I, I uh, had to write, uh, write it by myself in uh, Google Apps Scripts and it's something you don't want to do. <laughs> Brett Bauer is just asking um, Matillion compared to Google Cloud Events. Uh, ever looked at that? Cloud Events? Uh, you mean data flow or? For data processing and scheduling. I'm also not familiar with this topic. So Maybe Google sure. Data Flow. I don't know. Ma ma uh, Google Cloud Events. To, to be honest, I don't know what is Google Cloud Events. I know uh, Google Data Flow, which is uh, also another, let's say, ETL tool, which is very powerful, but you, you need to be very uh, capable to write your sc uh, scripts yourself because you can use Java or Python and it's not so nice and uh, not, not so, such a vis visual tool uh, like Matillion. I think he just replied and just can't scroll down in the comments for some reason. No, they are new, but I can't read anymore. Ah, here we go. They are new, a pain in the ass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, where does the link between ad spend and users come? That's probably now the next step that you are showing here with this massive flow. Uh -huh. 
Well, for each of the users, we obviously have attribution information. So we either know that this is a channel where he came from, or we can get it even on a more granular level. So we understand, for example, from Facebook, which ad did the user come from. So uh, each ad has its own unique identifier. And for each of the users, we know uh, his uh, like attribution identifier. So that's where we kind of connect the user to the ad that he came from. And we also know what the spend for the ad for a certain day was. So then we can calculate what was the CPI and how much we paid for that like average user per that day. Uh, we, we can show you how uh, the file or our data file from uh, AppSlayer looks like. Uh, this, this one is uh, uh, open in Google Sheets. And uh, we have a uh, attribute touch time, which means when it when he hit the uh, at, at install time when he uh, currently opened the app and uh, even time uh, we are looking at the uh, purchases so when the purchase happened so we have a uh, free columns uh, we use in our tool and uh, then we use event revenue so, so we know how much he spends and here are media source campaign campaign id so that's uh, what uh, martin was talking about and it, it's some is the way how we are connecting uh, raw level data with uh, costs and impressions from uh, Facebook or another ad network. Mm. And basically, like for today, we can uh, learn from AppsFlyer that we bought 250 users from campaign ID 123. And from the second data source, which would be Facebook, uh, we'd learn that today for the at 183, we paid five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And that's what we connect together. Yeah. Um Wakas Ahmed is asking how we can check which specific users coming from a paid campaign. Um keep in mind we are all sitting in Europe and looking at specific user data coming from Facebook or something like that is actually I, I think even Facebook is not allowing that. Um so we, we can't connect specific user data to a specific dollar that we uh, are spending rather than aggregated information. Oh uh, yeah, we probably need to have our lawyer besides us uh, <laughs> handle that, uh, as uh, we don't actually like operate it to ourselves, but uh, our clients are the ones responsible for operating the tool, and we're also not using the uh, a user's ID but AppSlayer ID to connect these things. So yeah, I'm afraid I won't give you like 100% clear answer, but I can ask about that. Yeah, Wakas, I really recommend to add, talk to AppsFly or Adjust or any other attribution provider how they handle these uh, information. Um, I don't know in which country you are sitting, but um, it, it's kind of difficult to answer uh, here in Europe. Yeah, we like read Facebook's terms of service when it comes to user level data from AppsFlyer. And once you only aggregate it for some purposes, they will allow you to use it but still it's forbidden to actually pass it over to external agencies. So that's something we were looking into. And uh, yeah, this was our solution to the problem that like we are not actually using the data as an agency, but uh, the client himself owns the data. And from his point of view, he can aggregate it freely the way I understand it. Mm -hmm. So I think we can go on. So. Yeah, I'd like to talk just a little bit more about what we're looking at right now. Uh, as Vitek said, there are just so many different cases where the data doesn't get downloaded that this is what happened for uh, for the connectors. Uh, sometimes we just get a blank document. Sometimes we just have incomplete set of data. So there has to be mechanisms that check if everything was received correctly, and this is what it came down to. So right now, we're using Matillion for downloading these data, but we are thinking about switching to some kind of an other tool which uh, serves as an intermediary between the ad network and our own database, and that actually takes care of all these API connections and in the end just sends you the final data that you need. And uh, I mean, there's probably no reason for us to do it otherwise because there's a lot of work that needs to go into maintaining connectors 
especially if you have 10 plus and networks and you don't really want to do it. Uh, it's not our core business. We have no problems paying for this externally once it comes to it. Uh, so, yep, that's something that I'd advise to other people. Yeah. Just use a tool for that. Don't worry about writing the connectors yourself uh, because you're going to spend much more in manpower than in US dollars for using uh, using a specialized tool. Uh, exactly. Matalan can handle has some connectors, for example, for Facebook, but for example, for Apple Search Ads, we wrote our our connectors uh, by Python. And it, that's something I need to maintain. And it's that's not something you want to do every day. Yeah, that's actually the thing that I, I encounter very often. Like, okay, I get the offer, like, yeah, I, writing the API uh, is quite easy. Let me do that. But then I'm thinking of, yeah, but you are gone in two weeks and uh, who's maintaining this if it's not working and stuff. So it's, I, I would also go the same direction and rather pay yeah. a tool. <laughs> yeah, it's very easy to write uh, API connector, but uh, API are uh, changing uh, twice a month and <laughs> you don't want to still uh, rewrite and test it. Yeah. yeah, it's fine if you have two networks, but if you have yeah. 15, then uh, you know who's going to do it? People just hate doing these types of things. So there's no reason why, why not to outsource this. All right, so uh, this is Batillion, and we're also using it besides the current API connectors to actually do the whole ETLing or transforming and enriching of the data that we download. Uh, we think if you can show like an outline of how that works. Um, uh, 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 here you can see a pipeline uh, when we combine uh, the data, uh, these data and uh, into one big table where we can see what uh, users uh, done in their life cycle. We have every information we need uh, for them uh, to calculate uh, what we want to see. But uh, this one, it's a very huge table, which is not capable to download to uh, Tableau and to visualize it, it, visualize it in a good way. So exactly, we, uh, we are making free tables uh, which Martin will describe uh, which are small aggregated and uh, we can uh, download them into Tableau and uh, look at them yeah I think, I think I can explain it let's let's put a presentation on uh, and yeah this is where we are so as we mentioned uh, basically for each of our users we have a table that's got like 700 rows and each of these rows represents one day in his lifetime. So for each of our users, obviously it's not like that, that we are really looking at each day once the user kind of falls out, but mostly it's like that, uh, that we're really looking at each of our users long-term and we are looking at if he made a purchase, how many sessions did we had, uh, so we can calculate retention. And this is all saved in the user level table, but uh, it's got like tens of millions of rows eventually. So it's not really useful for visualization. So that's why from the user level table, we are creating free aggregated tables, which have a much smaller size and which are basically three different ways we look at the source data. And uh, then we input these tables into Tableau and we can already visualize it. And these three tables, uh, we call it DCO or a cohort table, DX table, which is a lifetime table, and then date table, which is basically a table based on dates. And the difference is as follows. Uh, if we bought 10,000 users on January the 1st, and uh, our revenue was 50,000 on January 1st, then looking at that from the date table perspective, we're going to see just that. We had 10,000 users and we got 50,000 revenue. But perhaps these 10,000 users were only responsible for 5,000 of that revenue and 45,000 of revenue actually came from users that we bought before. So that's what we all also have to look at. And that's why we have the cohort table, which is where we look at each cohort or, uh, yep, we look at each cohort. So for example, for the first January, we'd be looking at these 10,000 people and the data will change every day as uh, the revenue from this cohort will compound. So the date table is basically looking just what happened on the 1st January, but the cohort table is uh, what happened 
with these 10,000 people that we acquired on the 1st January. I hope it makes sense. And uh, the DX table or the lifetime table is actually looking at users during their lifetime. So for example, we can take all users we acquired in January, then normalize them so their lifetime starts on the same day. And then we can understand how does, for example, their LTV develop over their life cycle. So that's also really important and really interesting to look, for example, when do the users stop paying or when do they start paying for uh, a, certain, uh, a certain item and stuff like that. So these are the three ways we're looking at the data based on cohorts, based on dates, and based on users' lifetimes. Any questions, Andre, around no, it's this? It's a really interesting approach. Uh, I haven't seen it this way. Um, so I've, I personally have no questions to this specific topic right now. All right. So uh, I just noticed that we're already running one hour plus. So uh, I'm just going to wrap things up. Um, one thing that we are currently working on is LTV predictions. And uh, yeah, that's basically using historical data to look into the future and understand whether the users that we are buying now will actually be profitable or not. And there are different ways to do it. And uh, each of these ways, which is retention-based, monetization-based, and behavior-based, uh, can be useful for different types of apps with different forms of monetizations, different LTV curves, and just different specifics. So we decided that we're just going to implement all of these and uh, just experiment with different apps, with different data that we have, and uh, learn which work in different like uh, situations and different combinations of dimensions. And this is something that we are going through right now. So we already have some results. And uh, I'll be happy to talk about it, for example, on one of the future streams. Right now, uh, I think I'll just skip it uh, and show you how our tool actually looks like. I'll start with the high-level overview, I think. When you, say, when you say your tool, then you mean the final dashboards in Tableau? Yes, exactly. OK, got it. Exactly. We're like calling it a tool. Uh, to be honest, the gist of the tool is actually uh, transforming the data in the correct way and creating these three tables. I think that it's like the, the biggest part of the know-how that we have. And the rest is basically just all right, which metrics do we want, what's really interesting for us, what's really interesting for this or that client, and uh, adjusting the visualizations in Tableau for his needs. So it's like the cherry on top of uh, all the work looking at uh, looking at it in Tableau and uh, mm -hmm. and consuming these insights. Um, just ca can you jump back to the three LTV prediction uh, methods again? Uh, I think this sure. was for some of our users a bit fast here. So it was intentionally fast because it's a very deep and interesting topic. So uh, yeah, I don't really want to dig into it today, but we can if you're interested. No, just just a uh, quick overview of what it actually is. So retention-based, um, what does that do? Well, the retention-based predictions are based on the idea that if you look at how are your users being retained after a couple of days, then you can use these data points to calculate how many days or active days will they spend in the app. And if you know uh, how, let's say, many cents or dollars do they spend per active day, you can actually just predict the curve and then predict how much money will that cohort spend uh, in the app. Mm -hmm. Next one. The next one is monetization based, or I think that a clearer way for it is like a ratio method. And it's based on your understanding uh, what is, for example, the ratio between day 180 LTV or day seven LTV, or in this case, it would not be LTV, like day 100 revenue and day seven revenue. So for example, you understand that uh, your revenue will triple from day seven to day 180. So that way, uh, obviously, if the app monetizes in a certain way, you can quite confidently say, after seven days of uh, gathering revenue, that your 
180 day revenue will be three times that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep, the final one is behavior based. And uh, this is actually the one that we talked about with Lior and uh, the concept uh, as we know it comes from him. And uh, it's basically correlating uh, the future spent or a probability that the user will become a customer uh, based on a set of events uh, that he actually does during his sessions, for example, during his first day. So uh, for each of these events, uh, you allocate a certain probability. So for example, if he uh, puts free items into the cart and clicks checkout and then has another session in two hours, that's probably going to be a very strong predictor of him being a payer in the future or a customer. But in case he just logs into the app once, clicks around a couple of times, then probably his probability of becoming a payer will be much lower. So uh, this method is based on acquiring a lot of data about user behavior and then correlating different events to the actual purchase and assigning probabilities to different combinations of purchases. Understand. Okay. All right. So these are LTV predictions. As I mentioned, it's a pretty wide topic. Uh, and to wrap things up today, uh, I'd like to show you the final product, uh, which is how the Roy looks in Tableau. Uh, this is a version of our high-level dashboard uh, with dummy data. And this is actually something that we provide our clients on a custom basis. So uh, based on which metrics we want to look at, uh, we can adjust it. Obviously, there are always the usual suspects, so installations, CPIs, uh, revenues, margins, uh, predicted and up to date ROIs, uh, then some other metrics like conversion rates in the store, conversion to payers or repeated payers, CTR, and stuff like that. So it's basically a very high level overview of the main metrics uh, that we're looking at. Uh, then we have a second dashboard, which is very highly utilized by our UA team, and is this one. And this one actually contains all information around our campaigns down to the ad level. And as you can see, the metrics we're looking at are installation, CPIs, costs for different things, now, the revenue, payers, different day X, ROIs, and stuff like that. And the way we look at it is uh, obviously we can aggregate it, for example, per week, but we can also look at it very granularly uh, per each day. So we can really dig down very simply to which channel, which uh, platform, which campaign, which ad set, and which ad. And here you can see that we have a record of these metrics for basically every day that this campaign ran. So we can kind of look at it in a very um, convenient fashion and understand not only the metrics, but also if you look at it from top to bottom, uh, like what is, uh, how does it evolve in time, basically? So that's where you, once something doesn't really work too well, or there are some fluctuations, you can always go like very deeply into the daily cohorts and really understand well uh, what is the cause of uh, changing the performance of the campaign. Mm -hmm. Other than that, obviously, you're not looking at it on a day level, but you usually choose a week level and look at it in this way. And uh, besides that, just really quickly, uh, this is like a testing dashboard. We don't really offer this to clients and we don't really show it to them too often, uh, but it's just uh, a demonstration of how can we use the lifetime data for our users to understand how the LTV evolves. So for example, here you can see, uh, we just created this for our uh, today's session purposes. Uh, you can see, how does Facebook use? How do Facebook users perform during different months? So, for example, if you look here, you can see that this is from September, and then the LTV curve. It's obviously only eighty-seven days, but the slope is pretty high, and the monetization definitely seems much better than, for example, from June or from November so far. And in this case, when you look at October, then on contrary, this definitely seems that there are many users because the fatter the line is the more users we have. But uh, so far, we have 48 days 
And there's a huge difference between the amount of money we were recouping in September than uh, we're recouping in October. So these are things that are actually possible with uh, the lifetime table that we're also using. And so, uh, yeah, I think that I'm going to stop here. There is just so many possibilities. You can like click through each of these charts, mm. filter it based on your needs, uh, add different metrics to compare. And uh, in case you know Tableau, you understand how versatile uh, the tool is and how many insights you can just simply mine from it. And I'll be happy to like give another demonstration much deeper of what we can do with the tool based on the design of the tables that we have uh, during another session. But uh, yeah, we could spend hours on this, basically. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I mean, the dashboards also develop over time uh, with the needs of a client yeah. or uh, the needs of the, if, if we understand the client as the UA manager who's act actively managing the campaigns and stuff, right? Uh -huh. um, maybe one question about the on ad level and ad set level information um when you work with different clients and i'm for example i i'm also building my dashboards myself in in tableau uh -huh. on on a lower level than you do um but what i encounter very often is that um clients have a very different naming structure naming convention of campaigns um many even have never thought about that um and this is very often a problem for me to read the data and uh, match the data from all the different uh, data sources. Uh, how, how do you cover that? Right now, we actually don't. That's the simple answer. Mm -hmm. uh, on our roadmap, we have a system where we'd actually fill in different names of campaigns and we'd synchronize that during the ETL process. So that's something that we're looking to change because obviously there are times where you know bad campaigns are being created. Uh, people that are not supposed to mess with campaigns, mess with them, and you just don't want to include these into the mix. Or just the naming structure is different on uh, uh, on different channels because different people uh, are managing different channels. Mm -hmm. It's like an ongoing problem that we definitely recognize. It was not a, like a too painful problem so far for us. So, you know, we have it on our radar, but uh, it did not happen yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for pulling the spent data from the different ad platforms, uh, do you have a specific, I mean, right now you're uh, creating your own uh, API calls and stuff, but uh, do you have specific tools in mind that you could recommend, for example? Um, Hi, Andre, Peter here. Hi, Peter. CEO of, uh, <laughs> and uh, I can take this. Uh, we don't have so many clients uh, leveraging uh, ad monetization at the moment, but I'm talking to Librink, uh, which someone mentioned in the comments uh, about half an hour ago. They are providing this kind of data. So as Martin said, you know, the roadmap is uh, quite long already. Uh, this is on our radar, but so far it wasn't urgent. So it's still uh, somewhere in the backlog. Mm -hmm. um, it, it might be a mean question, but maybe you can take this as well. What is, let's say, there are some other tools on the market, right? Like um, that are pulling cost information and providing fancy dashboards, uh, web-based, uh, maybe, I don't know, to name one, uh, Singular, or um, th there's maybe another one. Um... Epsumer was a pretty good one. Which one? Epsumer. Ah, true, Epsumer. I, I forgot the name. Yeah. Uh, but and there, there are plenty others, right? Um, is is it something that clients ask you, like, what is the difference? Um, what is better? What, why should I uh, use your tool? How, how are you charging for your service here, for example, also? Yeah, well, right now, we're not really charging anything for the tool. And if somebody decides that he wants to uh, perform the UA with us as an agency, then this is something that comes like complementary mm -hmm. with the service. So uh, that's what we do. And obviously, we're aware that there are tools on the market. At one point, we were thinking about actually offering this as a tool uh, and to productualize it, uh, which did not, uh, like, we eventually decided that it probably would not make sense because for the most part, people can use the AppSumer or Singular if they have money for it. And our added value is actually working with the custom data. So for example, it would be really hard for AppSumer or Singular to create really good custom LTV predictions, because that's where you actually have to have a data scientist that's working on it. And uh, that's like a long-term process. So that's where we see that uh, a potential advantage is. Uh, but still, 
Uh, for us, it's mostly deeply understanding the data, uh, having complete confidence that we have correct data in our dashboards, and uh, yeah, just understanding the whole process on a much deeper level than just plugging in a tool and consuming the insights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every customer has its own needs, right? And you can apply to that and deliver a certain dashboard only for this specific need then. Yeah, exactly. And like the big problem that I have with the tools that are on the market is that there are just so many that if you just wanted to understand what each of them does and what are the advantages and what are the limitations, you'd probably have to have two full-time people just to like keep track of all the changes and advancements and developments that are in the analytics space. So it's like crazy how fast everything is going. And it was actually also one reason why we decided that we we're going to develop something because that's where we really know what we are like working with, how it works. We can influence um, the features that will be implemented and we don't have to spend time just like looking around, okay, this guy is doing this or that. And, and then just figuring out what the downside is along the way. Right now we know all the downsides and uh, can like confidently Uh, confidently use it and uh, and know the limitations. I yeah, understand. Uh, we are done with the presentation, right? Uh, if you want, you can turn on your camera. Yeah, I think that... Or oh, you're naked already. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. our knowledge was stripped from us. <laughs> I think that's, at least for me, it was super insightful. And I think with the comments and reactions, uh, we also got quite some great feedback here already. And I'm pretty sure some more people will watch this whole thing afterwards. Um, so it's, uh, I think you're probably available even after the stream, answering all the questions that are popping in the comments. Um, yeah, anything else you want to mention as a last, last word? Definitely. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we were happy to do it. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, it's nice to get actively involved with the mobile marketing experts group community. So that was really great that we could kind of give back after watching a couple of videos from other people. Uh, so let's hope it grows. Uh, we're open to like doing another stream if there's going to be interest to delve deeper into any kind of a topic uh, that we briefly mentioned. Also, sorry for... <laughs> A little bit too late, too long, because the plan was to wrap things up in 30 minutes. So that's, um, yeah, never happens. But hopefully it was interesting for the people that stayed till the end. And uh, uh, let me know if there are many, any questions and uh, we'll be happy to answer these. Cool. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure to talk to you and uh, keep us posted about the LTV models. I think that's another topic that uh, could need a deep dive. Um, so ping me if you are ready to share some more insights here and we can book another hour or two to dig into that topic. <laughs> Better two hours. <laughs> How today ended up. Cool. So Andre, thanks for having us. It was a pleasure. Thank uh, you. Thanks everyone. See you soon then.